what's in your water. Today we'll talk about 10 toxins, deadly toxins potentially, which you have in your drinking water. But we also talk about how that water used in dialysis, which by, which by the gastrointestinal barrier and is in contact with blood through a semi-permeable membrane could be of dire consequences as well. My name is Sevag Demirjan and welcome to Kidney Guide. Before we go through our top 10 list, I would like to walk you through city water treatment process to understand things a little better. The following is a traditional water purification plant setup. For processing of surface water, you start with coagulation, then flocculation, sedimentation, and filtration. One of the ways you get rid of the non-settling suspended solids is the use of flocculant. Aluminum sulfate is the most commonly used chemical due its dissociation to multiple charged particles, which in turn bind with colloidal particles in the water, which helps particles clamp or flock together and precipitate. This will lead suspended solids to be aggregated to a bigger mass, increasing their weight and become heavy enough to settle to the bottom. Flocculation is an essential step as a means to remove suspended solids, which precedes filtration in order to avoid clogging. As water moves slowly through large settling basins, heavy clumps of flock settle to the bottom of the tanks and are removed. Cleaner water passes through the top of the tank to the filtration chamber, where gravity pulls water through filter media made of carbon-based material and sand. Next, chlorine, chloramine, and fluoride are added to kill microorganisms and promote dental health. Now that you have a basic knowledge how water is purified, let's go through 10 things in water that you need to worry about. Aluminum, as we just saw, is added to water at the water purification plant. Other sources include rainwater, industrial runoff, consumer products, and leaching from soil and rock. Medications can be another source for aluminum. In addition, citrate and citric acid can increase the absorption of aluminum. Low levels of aluminum in drinking water might be okay. Per EPA, it should be less than 0.05 parts per million, but high levels may be associated with neurological effects. Prior to widespread use of reverse osmosis in the treatment of water, dialysis patients were at high risk for chronic exposure, which led to many neurological abnormalities, microcystic anemia, and bone toxicity. Next chemical added to water that you need to worry about is chlorine and chloramine. They have been used for water disinfection for more than 100 years and are pretty effective. Chlorination, however, may result in some unintended consequences. Levels of chlorine in drinking water above the EPA set limit of four can result in gastrointestinal symptoms and more seriously can form halogenated chemicals known as disinfection byproducts, DBP, which are known carcinogens. Chlorine and chloramine levels are closely monitored in dialysis treatment facilities to avoid catastrophic hemolysis and methemoglobinemia. Next on the list of additives to drinking water is fluoride. Low amounts of fluoride is added to drinking water to promote dental health. It also may be naturally present in groundwater to varying degrees. The EPA said limit for fluoride in drinking water is four milligrams per liter, but on occasion, equipment map function in water plants have resulted in breakouts of people with gastrointestinal symptoms due to high levels of fluoride. Also chronic high level exposure may lead to bone disease. In dialysis patients, 
acute exposure to high levels can manifest as severe itching and may lead to cardiac arrest. Next on the list is the much dreaded lead toxicity. Although lead poisoning is often due to ingestion of lead-containing paint chips by children, there remains significant lead-based pipe infrastructure concentrated in a handful of states, including many of the states in the Rust Belt along the Great Lakes, such as Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and also Florida and Texas. Of note, the introduction of monochloramine as a disinfectant in order to reduce carcinogenic byproducts can result in higher levels of corrosion of lead piping and higher levels in the water. Chronic exposure to elevated lead levels above the EPA limits can lead to kidney disease and lead nephropathy. It can also result in peripheral neuropathy and neurological symptoms and anemia. Lead exposure in dialysis patient has also been linked to uremic pruritus. Nitrates and nitrites are organic chemicals that consist of nitrogen and oxygen atoms. Nitrates find their way to water sources from agricultural runoffs and fertilizer use. Also from wastewater discharges and leaking septic tanks. Pre-EPA, nitrate level safe for drinking is less than 10 per million parts. Children who drink milk prepared with nitrate contaminated water are particularly susceptible to methemoglobinemia, where hemoglobin protein in blood that transports oxygen is converted to methemoglobin, which cannot transport oxygen anymore. This leads to low oxygen levels, cyanosis, which is skin discoloration. Toxicity in dialysis patients can also lead to nausea, vomiting, and hemolytic anemia. The next water pollutant is one of the first metals known. Mercury is naturally occurring heavy metal, which evaporates from the Earth's crust. Major sources include coal-powered power plants, mining operations, particularly in Texas, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Mercury can also result from waste incineration and breakdown of consumer products. Toxic effects of mercury primarily impact digestive and neurological systems. Chronic exposure can lead to acrodynia, which means painful extremities in Greek, associated with skin changes, also called Pink's disease. Kidney disease could be another manifestation due to tubular injury. No specific toxicity has been reported in dialysis patients. The next two very serious water-related hazards are microorganisms and their breakdown products. This is typically controlled by use of chlorine and chloramine, but there are alternatives such as ultraviolet radiation and use of ozone. It's very important for users of privately owned wells to monitor for germs in addition to chemicals and pay particular attention to known problems in their local area, particularly in there is flooding, land disturbances, and nearby waste disposal areas. Per primary drinking water standards, also known as Maximum Contaminant Levels, MCL, which was established by the Safe Drinking Water Act, there should be no organisms present in drinking water. The presence of coliform bacteria in drinking water indicates contamination by animal waste. Accordingly, these are monitored very closely with goal of less than one colony forming unit per 100 mLs of water. 
Although you may find a lot of bacteria in one glass of water, most are not harmful. Although there are certain bacteria, such as E. coli, certain strains, Salmonella, Shigella, which can cause gastrointestinal illnesses and serious problems. Dialysis fluid produced by combining treated water and acid-based concentrates may contain microorganisms and bacterial products. Standard dialysis fluid has bacterial count of less than 100 CFUs per ml, which, if unchecked, can lead to bloodstream infections with fatal complications. And the toxin level threshold is less than 0.5 EU per ml, which can stimulate the immune system and may lead to heightened inflammatory states. Higher grade of water quality, ultra pure water can be achieved by introducing additional strategically placed filters. To achieve bacterial counts of 0.1 CFU per ml and in the toxin levels of less than 0.03 EU per ml. Sterile water, on the other hand, such as prepackaged saline solutions used in a hospital, which can be used for intravenous administration, have more stringent thresholds and are typically prepared by vapor compression distillation. The last two pollutants on the list are very ubiquitous and worrisome. PFAS are widely used family of chemicals which have been around for decades. They break down very slowly over time. That's why they're also called forever chemicals. PFAS has been used extensively in commercial and industrial products to create water-resistant fabrics, non-stick cookware, and in fire extinguishers, photo industry, paint, and cleaning product, to name a few. Just recently, the EPA issued guidance regarding PFAS levels in drinking water. No similar cutoff has been announced regarding water quality for hemodialysis yet. PFAS-associated toxicity is the subject of much research and scrutiny, so stay tuned. The last, but by no means the least, is microplastics. They're found in food, air, water, and soil. They are everywhere. Main sources include degraded plastic waste and industrial effluent to the tune of 300 million metric tons per year. The potential hazards associated with microplastics come in three forms, physical particles, chemicals, and microbial pathogens. This is a major environmental and health hazard that is accumulating at a relentless pace, and there is much we can do about it. The following is a guide to relative particle size starting at the very small H2O water molecule, followed by larger organic compounds such as glucose and PFAS. Next comes proteins and large molecules such as endotoxins. Viruses can be as small as 45 nanometers or larger such as coronaviruses in the couple of hundred nanometer range. Bacteria show up in the micro-scale territory with relatively wide range, followed by larger parasites such as Giardia and Cryptosporidium. And finally, we get to where things are visible to the naked eye. Reverse osmosis membranes have a pore size less than one nanometer. They remove particles as small as monovalent ions, essentially desalinating water, and only pure water goes through. Nanofilters remove nearly all viruses and divalent ions. Ultrafiltration filters, which is typical of dialysis membranes, may remove most viruses and bigger pathogens, but not dissolved substances. 
Microfilters, on the other hand, filter out most microorganisms, but not viruses. Hope you enjoyed the presentation.